hymn number 217, Once in Royal David City. Let's stand together to sing all the verses of this hymn. We invite the boys and girls to come to the front for our children's sermon. Good morning, boys and girls. How are you this morning? How many of you like to play basketball or watch? Oh, we got lots of basketball fans here. Well, I got a nice basketball here ready to, ready to go. And um, we play some basketball. Uh, Oh, you're right. What's missing? The air. the air. You have to have air. You need to have a ball that looks more like this, don't you? If I can get it. There. That's what you need for a basketball, isn't it? Now, what's this? A pump, yeah. But when I think about blowing up a basketball, does it work just to take this and just to stick it here where the, the hole is and just put it in? Does anybody know what else you need? Yeah? Air. Air, and what else? Anybody know? Yes? You need to put it in the right hole, and something else needs to go in there, too. 
A needle, that's right. You need a needle. And you know, at our house, we lose things like needles quite often. Do you ever have that in your house? We have that in our house sometimes, too, where you lose the needle. And we keep our needle right in here so that we don't lose it. Because it's really important because it makes the connection between the air and what you're going to blow up, in this case, a ball. You have to have the needle. Is the needle very big? It's very small, but it's really important. And I think about that because sometimes, boys and girls, maybe we don't feel very important. We think other people have big jobs to do, and we're really not that important. But you know what? We're like that needle that you need to have to blow up the basketball. The Lord uses us, and he works through us. Maybe a smile. Maybe it's a song that we sing. Maybe it's a helping thing that we do. The Lord uses us to do his work and to serve him. And that means we're really pretty small. We're not very big. Yet we are important, aren't we? We're important for the way that God would use us and have us live for him. So don't ever tell you that you're not important because you're small or young. We are all important, and the Lord wants to use every single one of us. Okay? Is that good? Yeah. And, yeah, I think I better blow this up before we use that, don't you think? Yeah, it doesn't work. Well, I have s- some treats to give you, and um, then you can go back and sit with your families. Just one, okay? (laughs) Careful, careful, careful. I can I can get you one right here. There you go. There you go. We read the Word of God this morning from the Gospel according to John, the first chapter. If some of you have gone to a festival of lessons and carols where they read various passages and sing hymns, then you will know that John chapter 1 is the last passage that it's read. It's somewhat the climax. It is a wonderful theological statement about the coming to Christ, of Christ to the world. John John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that had been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. 
Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then we read also from the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming, instead speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up unto him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. <clears throat> Glory is a word that we don't use that often in our normal day-to-day -day conversation. For example, around the supper table, it would be pretty rare that someone would say, well, I saw glory in the grocery store, or in the office, or in gym class today. No, glory is a, is a big word, and it's usually a, a large idea something great and something very important. I was thinking about glory one day this week. Remember that day when it was very foggy in the morning? And then somehow, sometime maybe mid to late morning, all of a sudden the sun came out and you saw the trees. They were all beautiful because they had frozen fog on them, and now the blue sky and the sunlight was shining on them. Did you see that? It was beautiful. We might say there was glory in nature that day. Well, as we think about the Christmas story, we surely think about glory. We will sing a number of times in this season, Glory in excelsis Deo. Glory to God in the highest. And in so doing, we are echoing the words of Isaiah the prophet, who said, The glory of the Lord will be revealed, and we shall see it together. We're doing it remembering the glory of the people Israel when God came to the tabernacle and to the temple in a great blaze of glory to show his presence coming to those places of worship. And we remember when we speak of glory in excelsis Deo that John writes about the word that is, Jesus, who became flesh and lived among us, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Full of grace, full of truth. And my friend, those two words are vitally important to keep in mind. And we have to keep them in balance. This isn't a magic trick. Some of you maybe have a bird like this at your home. It's perfectly balanced. And that's why I can hold it up like that. And it stays where it is. Grace and truth are vital parts 
of our lives. Jesus Christ came full of grace and truth. And the ministry of the Church of Jesus Christ must have grace and truth. Loving kindness is a word that the Old Testament used. A free gift of God that he bestowed upon his people. Now, boys and girls, there's a lot of songs that are on the radio these days that talks about if you're naughty, you're nice. And whether you're naughty or nice will indicate or say whether Santa Claus is going to give you the gift you want. Grace is not like that. Because none of us earn by our own good behavior God's merit. He pours it out on us freely in an amazing and wonderful way. No, matter our heart, no wonder our hearts are thrilled when we sing amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Grace and truth. Truth is what is real and genuine. You know what the word for the year 2018 is? Some committee or group of people got together and they declared that the word for the year was misinformation. Misinformation. Or maybe it's what some people call fake news. Or how about just this? It's untruth. It's lies. It's kind of a sad thing, isn't it, for our country <coughs> that the word for the year has to do with what's not true. We, as the people of God, must always stand for truth because Jesus Christ came to be full of grace and truth. I've got a $20 bill here. It's the real thing. But let's imagine that I would turn it over and it would be blank on the other side. How many of you would want to take that for payment? And say, no, that's not the real thing. It's counterfeit. And so, too, the witness of the Christian faith needs to have both sides, grace and truth. And as you're thinking and talking and discussing in the days to come, make sure you're always speaking about truth and always speaking about grace. They must always be kept together. As hard as it sometimes is. And I know that I have been in elders' meetings where we have talked about particular situations within perhaps the life of the congregation. And sometimes it's really hard to keep those in balance. And someone will say, you need to hear the truth about this. And they'll speak the truth. And someone else will say, yes, but we need to hear the grace. Which one's right? They both are. We always need to hear both grace and and truth. Oh, this is such a marvelous picture that John gives to us of the Word that became flesh. Jesus became a real person and he lived among us. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 is a verse that maybe we don't see too often on Christmas cards but it certainly could be there. It says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, 
Yet for your sake, he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Now, he's not talking about money. Although heaven is a place where the streets are gold. But Jesus left all that it was perfect and wonderful in heaven. He left that to become a baby born in a stable. He became poor so that we who were spiritually poor might become rich. And what are those riches? The riches are all the blessings that he gives to us. Forgiveness, new life, adoption into his family. Now, does that sound like a good trade? Not for Jesus, but wonderful for us. Because we had, as Isaiah says, our best good works, our filthy rags. But because Jesus came to earth, we can have the white robes of righteousness. I like that trade for us, don't you? The prophets had written about the coming of Jesus. They wrote that his coming would bring glory to the people of Israel. And he did. And one of the wonderful passages comes from the book of Hebrews. And I would suggest that for your reading this week. Read Hebrews chapter 1, where it talks about the one who was prophesied for many years and who has now come. And that's the introduction to the theme of the book of Hebrews, how Jesus is superior to all things of the Old Testament. He fulfilled it. He became, he perfectly fulfilled the law. And he became God's perfect picture of grace. So, what is grace and truth? What do those mean to gather for us? I'd like to suggest that they mean comfort. Comfort, not just as a soft pillow and blanket. It's comfort to live by. Comfort, really, the last part of it, comes from the same word that we get our word fortitude from. Strength. The comfort that we have is the strength of God, His truth, and His grace. This week I was watching on TV and they were talking about how many of the schools have had bomb threats against them just in the past few days. And I was thinking about that's something when I was a teenager we never had to worry about in our schools. Or so many of the other, so many of the other things that make life really difficult for young people. You know what our comfort is, my young friends? It's the strength of Jesus. It's the strength to face troubles. It's courage to live bravely, bravely, knowing that his truth will always last and his grace is always there to forgive us and to help us with all our life's needs. All flesh would see him, the prophet Isaiah says. The glory of God revealed. Full of grace and truth. And then later on in the passage, it says this, which is marvelous. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. 
one after another, the fullness of his grace. Maybe some of you, as you are getting your sugar cookies or your Christmas cookies ready, will read, you have to put just a pinch of this or just a little tiny bit of that in your recipe. But that's not the kind of grace and truth we receive from the Lord. He keeps giving it and giving it and giving it again. It's kind of like this. You know, sometimes in our lives, we're going along and we, we're kind of like building our lives and, and then, then we keep building and we forget about the Lord and, and we kind of get things messed up. And the Lord says, I have something for you. I have my grace. The blood of Jesus Christ. And then, then another day we go on and we're, we maybe tell a couple things that aren't quite true and maybe we, we cheat a little bit or, or we lie or, or we hurt somebody, we say something unkind. And maybe we, we miss what we're supposed to do and our, our prayer life starts to kind of going sour. And, we mess up. The Lord says, I have something for you. I have more of my grace. Try again. So we try again. And we have really good intentions of, of doing the things that will please him. But we kind of get a little bit lackadaisical in our spiritual lives. Not praying very much. Don't talk to our spouse very nicely. Disobey our parents. God says, got something for you again. Got more of my grace. His grace keeps coming and coming, and coming. And his truth is forever sure. And that truth is important to us too. Let's suppose that we go to the dentist and we've eaten a lot of Halloween candy and we haven't done such a good job of brushing or flossing our teeth. And the dentist looks in our mouth he says, I'm going to take an x-ray. And he takes an x-ray of our mouth. And he said, you know, looking at this x-ray, it shows that you have three cavities. But you know what? I'll tell you what. I won't tell your mom or dad that you had those cavities. I got some white stuff here. and I'll put it over where the cavities are so they can't see it. And we'll just all say it's good and, and not pretend that there's anything there. Would that work? Not for long it wouldn't. Because the dentist has to take those cavities and he has to drill out the decayed part and put in the filling. Because that which is untruth will never last very long, will it? And it can cause great damage. Jesus came to speak truth. And he came to announce the truth. Do you know there's a place in the Bible where Jesus actually says why he was born? Yes, he does. 
And it comes, perhaps, surprisingly, when he's on trial. And he's before Pilate. And Pilate doesn't think very much of truth, because he's lived in a world where people just say whatever they do, they want to say. And, Jesus, and Pilate has having this conversation with Jesus and says, You are king then? Jesus says, You say that I am a king. In fact, this reason I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is on the side of truth listens to me. Jesus speaks truth. He teaches us how to live truth. And when we sing, O Holy Night, we sing those words. Truly, he taught us to love one another. And in the book of Ephesians, it says, always speaking the truth in love. They go together. You can't separate them. Speak the truth in love. Grace upon grace. Truth, because Jesus Christ calls us to be people of truth. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of this world will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. Would you pray with me? Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your holy and precious word. And as this morning we have been reminded that Jesus Christ came to be full of grace and truth. May we as your people live grace and live truth and follow Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. You want to remember?